Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of this wonderful institution, which is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis. Beautiful. <laughs> now, oh, and this is your first visit to the Constitution Center. You see our wonderful congregation is able to recite <laughs> the creed of the Constitution Center. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm so moved and eager to share with you one of the greatest teachers I've ever had who made possible the vision that we're trying to achieve here at the Constitution Center of bringing together people of different perspectives for respectful debate about ideas. I had the incredible fortune when I was a first year law student in 1988 to have Owen Fiss for civil procedure. And civil procedure is a dry subject that teaches you how to file motions in courts. I actually can't tell you too much about how civil procedure actually works <laughs> because Owen chose to focus, instead of the technicalities of civil procedure, on a single case, Goldberg versus Kelly. And Goldberg versus Kelly is a case about whether the government can deprive people of welfare benefits without a hearing. And he introduced this case, and what emerged was the most riveting, respectful, rich exchange of ideas that I'd ever experienced as a student with this master teacher who had a clear view of the law as an engine of justice and of fundamental values, but was nevertheless eager to encourage people of different perspectives to challenge him and to debate that premise. And I don't remember the details of what we discussed, and I really don't remember much civil procedure. But <laughs> in, the course was called Meta Procedure, and that's what all of us who took it uh, took away. But I realized that I was in the presence of the, the greatest teacher that I'd ever had in my life. And it's so meaningful to welcome him here, because Owen, what we're trying to do here at the center is what you taught us to do back more than 25 years ago, which is to be open to ideas, to educate ourselves throughout life, always to be lifelong learners and to be respectful of different perspectives so we can try together to converge around the truth. And what's so exciting, friends, is that this book is a book about 13 of Owen's greatest teachers and his vision of the law and his heroes in the law, the people who inspired him to carry on this torch of reason. He calls one of his teachers, uh, Anton Barak, an apostle of the Enlightenment. And that's what Owen Fiss is. I can't wait for you to meet him and learn from him. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Owen Fiss. I'm not going to say another word. <laughs> <laughs> you have to, because you've got to tell people about these phenomenal teachers and inspire them as much as you've inspired me. Tell me why you chose these 13 teachers and why you chose to write the book. Well, I, in November 2014, uh, the person who appears on the cover of this book named John Doerr, uh, who I had worked for in the Department of Justice, and I worked for during the impeachment inquiry uh, that was centered on Richard Nixon in the uh, early 70s. Uh, John Doar died uh, at age 92. And I was asked to speak at a memorial service for him that was to be held in January of 2015. And uh, I went to work on preparing my remarks and uh, worked pretty hard at them, uh, delivered the address in January, uh, and I was touched by the reception that it had received, uh, not just from the lawyers, but from many non-lawyers that were present in the audience. But I was especially touched and moved when I returned to New Haven and started a conversation with my then research assistant, Dan Rausch, a second year law student. And he told me 
a little bit about how meaningful it was to know about John Doerr. This was a name he might have heard, but he didn't really know about him. Uh, he didn't really know the essence of his character, didn't know the nature of his achievements. Uh, and as we talked, I spend a considerable amount of time with my students, uh, it became clear to me that there was a need, a need uh, in the present generation uh, to understand some of the people who had shaped law for the last half century. And uh, so I reflected back uh, on the people that were not just important for the law, uh, but people that I knew and in, admired and who inspired me uh, and went to work uh, on this book uh, that Jeff has in his hands. And I view it as unlike anything else I've ever written. Nothing I've written is anything close to this. Uh, but it's a, a book that I wrote uh, to inspire uh, and to instruct uh, the next generation of lawyers. And I felt the need of it in January 2015 and felt the need of it uh, as uh, the book unfolded as I began interacting with other students and talking to them about it. But quite frankly, um, I must have had sort of an angel on my back. Uh, I feel the need today, after the events of November 9th, 2016, even more so. Uh, I think we're at a moment when it's tremendously important to understand what law is capable of uh, and how it can give shape and direction to the nation's uh, deepest ideals. What's so important about what you just heard is Owen Fiss's idealistic vision of law. In this book, as in our classroom, he rejected cynics like partisans of law and economics who believe that law is only efficiency or critical legal studies who believe that law is all politics. And he talks about law as a disciplined passion that can create justice. And at the end of your discussion of Morton Horowitz, you say, you've been guided by the hope that a discourse that locates fundamental values in the Constitution and puts the judiciary to the task of articulating those principles that will govern us for all time, will discipline the justices and give us a set of standards that can be used to evaluate their performance. This is what I saw you said in Washington in April 1955, not a free-floating idealism, but rather a studied attempt to use the ways of law to realize the idealistic possibilities of the Constitution. In April 1955, as you talk about in the book, you were a young high school student and you went to the Supreme Court and you stood in line and you just happened to walk into a courtroom that was having Thurgood Marshall arguing a, the remedy issue in Brown versus Board of Education. Tell us about that remarkable experience and then tell us about how you came to clerk for and know Thurgood Marshall and how he inspired you. Well, uh, I, you know, in April 1955, uh, I was a senior in a high school in Manhattan. I don't think I had ever been out of the city of New York uh, at that time in my life. Uh, and a few of us, very close friends, uh, decided we'd take a trip uh, to Washington, D.C. And we made all the rounds to uh, the monuments. Uh, and then we decided, well, we might as well take in the Supreme Court and stood in line and uh, waited uh, uh, for a while and got in uh, and sat down. Uh, and uh, there was a tall, uh, extremely handsome, uh, you could see his sort of inner strength, a lawyer arguing before the justice, 
uh, a black man sort of located in a sea of white faces. And uh, I and my friends uh, sat there, took it in, did not know who he was, did not know what the case was, uh, and only in once we uh, exited, and uh, maybe not even that day, uh, understood that the lawyer was Thurgood Marshall and the case was the remedial phase of Brown versus the Board of Education. Maybe the first slide could be projected. It's right there. It's on. Yeah, it's on. That's him. <laughs> And you could see the expression on this picture, as best as I could ascertain, was taken in April 1955. And I feel that the expression on his face uh, was a premonition of about what the ruling in the second Brown case was going to be. Because remember, Jeff, in the second Brown case, uh, the Supreme Court rejected his plea, which was to dismantle the Jim Crow system immediately. And it instead ordered that the dis Jim Crow system be dismantled with all deliberate speed. And uh, uh, you could see from the expression on his face, I think, uh, the touch uh, of disappointment that uh, he, he felt at that moment. Now, Jeff asked in his question how I uh, came to clerk with him almost 10 years later after I uh, went to college, did graduate work in philosophy, decided to go back to the law, uh, attended law school, and then uh, uh, applied for a clerkship with him in April I'm sorry, in November of uh, 1963. He was then a judge uh, on the Second Circuit. Um, I, I won't pause to give you the rest of the history uh, that you asked for, Jeff, if I may skip over it. Uh, the rest of the history could unfold when we talk about uh, someone like Justice Brennan. Um, but this is the important part. This is the important part. In that group was Morton Horowitz. Morton Horowitz uh, was a high school friend of mine. He's now a very distinguished professor at the Harvard Law School. Um, and he sat through that very same experience that I sat through. And uh, as the book explains in some uh, detail, I don't know if we're able to flip back to the the photograph of Morton Horowitz. It's yes, Nicandra is going to show it to us right now. It's all the way near the back. Yeah. Keep going. That's it. Okay. That's Morton Horowitz. And Morton Horowitz uh, is, was and still is, I guess, one of the leaders of critical legal studies. Uh, critical legal studies understands by their slogan I think captures the essence, is law is politics. And he has a kind of understanding uh, of law generally uh, that it's a reflection of politics. Not politics in the sense I say in the book, the difference between Republicans and Democrats, but that a society is dominated by divisions between uh, people or among people who have different conceptions of the good. And law happens, this is Harwood speaking, law happens to be uh, just a reflection of who possesses the power and the machinery of the state and is able to in, impose its view uh, on, uh, on the country. Um, and he came, he came away from that experience uh, as attached, when I say came away, a lifetime of coming away, he came away from that experience as attached to the Brown decision as I am. Uh, we both were sort of electrified by that moment. 
uh, but we have different conceptions on what it represents. Uh, for Morty Horowitz, uh, it's a form of politics uh, that the Warren Court and all it stood for uh, was expression of our democratic ethos. By democratic, he means it's, it has a certain measure of social inclusiveness, and Earl Warren and the other justices were able to impose that on, uh, on society. Uh, so he celebrates the same decision I celebrate, but has a very different interpretation. Uh, he views it more or less like um, of, of political expression. From my perspective, maybe this is getting too much of a play of first year procedure, Jeff, but from my perspective, uh, I have a different conception of it. Uh, I see the Constitution of the United States embodying a promise, it has many promises, but one of its fundamental promises is a promise of racial equality that we were gonna achieve in this country uh, and transform it into a community of equals, even though we began with slavery and even though we had the Civil War as uh, a culmination of that. And I see in the 14th Amendment a promise of racial equality, and I see Thurgood Marshall standing before the court asking the court to hold up to the promise that the Constitution made. And he was using the ways of the law as an unfolding of that ideal uh, of racial equality. It's not just politics, the imposition of, my, of their, his view of the good on society or Earl Warren's view of the good on society. What Brown was was the justices using the reason at their disposal and that they were entitled to, to give concrete meaning and expression to this ideal of racial equality. And for me, that's law. That's what law is about. You can tell, friends, that Owen Fiss's vision of law is idealistic, and he describes in this book coming of age at a time when the Warren Court was pursuing justice and applying the public reason that he thinks the Constitution requires. And yet, Owen, I remember even back when I was in your class with the effrontery of youth challenging you for being too idealistic. Why would you imagine that the courts will always be occupied, I said, as other of your friendly critics have said, by people who share this expansive vision of justice. In the future, they might come to be occupied by others, and therefore, shouldn't we have a constrained vision of the courts uh, that are not free to impose expansive visions of justice that might be contested? And you quote another of your heroes, Robert Cover, to similar effect. You have Robert Cover saying to you, I, like Owen, celebrate the achievements of federal courts in destroying, uh, destroying apartheid in America, but it is Fiss, not Cover, who is the romantic here. It is Fiss who supposes that these achievements emerge out of a shared community of interpretation that is national in character. I support these efforts because I believe them right and justified. At times, the federal courts have been our allies in these commitments. There's every reason to believe that such a convergence of interests was temporary and accidental, and that it is already changing and will soon be a romantic memory of the sublime 60s. What is your response to Cover and to, to people like me who were skeptical that this was a golden romantic age that is not likely soon to return. <laughs> well, um, I, I am a romantic. I, I see the law as the embodiment of these national values, and uh, I see the justices and people like Thurgood Marshall uh, embarked on the project of uh, giving, as I said before, meaning and expression to them. 
Now, Jeff, how could I live? How could I live for the last 40 years and not appreciate the truth of what you just said? How could I sit here today in 2017 and not appreciate the truth of what you said? That people may be entrusted with uh, uh, power, the judicial power, and not use it for the purposes I see it, but for other purposes. And in fact, lead us away from the ideals that unite us and inspire us. Of course this is true, but we have to ask ourselves, Jeff, what is the appropriate response? The appropriate response is not, I urge you, not to, as I'm just using the phrase, you, not to impose limits, not to deny power. Our appropriate response is to be deeply critical of what passes as the law and to make sure that the courts get back on the track. I mean, I, I, I think the response to my, if you will, excessive romanticism is not a, a kind of skepticism or even cynicism or the search for placing artificial limits or placing kind of rules of thumb that will limit the power. Uh, because I, I, I think the one lesson that comes from my career in the law and that romantic era is the good that could come from this conception of judicial power. I mean, whatever we are today, think of what was achieved in this period, roughly 1954 to 1974. I mean, a tremendous amount of good was achieved, not just on the racial score, also I think in terms of reforming the criminal process, reforming the civil process. It laid the foundations for the uh, laid the foundations for many of the decisions of, that were important for the women's movement. And so my feeling is that I, 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 I see the truth of your skepticism, but I urge you not to, not to remain a skeptic, but go back to the sources of the power and try to rejuvenate and bring it back. And that, in many respects, is the point of the book. I want a new generation of lawyers that will be able to do what Thurgood Marshall did, what William Brennan did, what John Doar did, what uh, Burke Marshall did. These are, these are, this, this is the burden of their history. There is another lesson that I take from the book and I took from your class and that I try to share with our fellow citizens every day, and that is the beauty and meaning of intellectual debate and of complete openness to clashing points of view and to a passion for exploring ideas wherever they may lead. And that was the openness that you embodied more inspiringly than anyone I've experienced and that you describe in your great colleagues and teachers, including Harry Calvin, the great First Amendment theorist, and others, and you have a passion for Yale Law School as an, as an enclave of reason, where public reason and ideas were always preeminent. Tell me about where that came from and how you tried to how, so successfully impart that value to your students. I, I'm not sure where it came from. <laughs> Uh, but I do believe in it because although I, I speak, and that's why maybe I bristle a little bit uh, at the term romantic. I mean, it's romantic in terms of my aspirations. But I believe that the unfolding of these ideals, 
that I see embodied in the Constitution is a very, very complicated and difficult process. I mean, I was greatly moved uh, by what I saw in April 1955, but I've spent at least uh, um, a good chunk, uh, I wouldn't say, I was gonna say 25 years, of really trying to understand what racial equality uh, uh, entailed. What is, what is it, what does it mean to implement the decree that was issued by the court in Brown? Does it mean that we have to stop assigning students to schools on the basis of race? Or does it mean that the, that the, um, that the pattern of racial assignment uh, is impermissible, regardless of whether they're assigned on the basis of race or on the basis of the neighborhood school policy. And I, I understand the difficulty of resolving that question. There's no simple justice. Justice is not simple. Justice is extremely difficult. And I, I think my willingness to enter into discussion uh, with people with whom I vehemently disagree is acknowledgement, an, an acknowledgement of the difficulty uh, of understanding what justice requires. Never to give up the search for justice, but to understand the extraordinary difficulty uh, of uh, of uh, finding out what justice requires. Now the other thing, which I want to pick up on Jeff's question, is that I, I believe that that's what the teacher should do. I'm, I'm not teaching students what civil procedure requires. I'm not teaching them what, when they should file papers and how they'll do. All of them know that by the end of the course, despite the disclaimers of Jeff. <laughs> all of them know it. I deny that I'm teaching him it, but I, all of them know, because I want him to understand we're not here teaching the technicalities of the rules of procedure. We are trying to find out what justice requires for procedure. The case that Jeff mentioned at the beginning of the session Goldberg versus Kelly, is a question, as he said, of the termination of welfare and the insistence upon a procedure that our welfare recipients whose aid had been terminated wanted to institute to find out whether the termination was justified. And the question before the class was, is that justice? And this is my, my philosophy about teaching is not to propound an answer to them, because I'm not sure of the answer, but to invite them into the discussion to figure out what the answer is at the joint enterprise. And that's what the Yale Law School is about. That's, that's, my, that's my love of the institution. Uh, I, I certainly felt that, I see Mark Arnczyk in the audience here, he will t I certainly felt that about the University of Chicago Law School when I taught, and I taught that also. And uh, I, I, think, I, I, I think I invite students to embark on a journey with me to figure out what justice requires. And that's, that has to involve the entertainment of perspectives that, uh, of everyone sitting in the room. It's I, uh, I, <laughs> I'll tell one funny story, if I may. Uh, um, my parents, when I started teaching at the University of Chicago, my parents wanted to sit in my class. I said, absolutely not. not <laughs> it's not. This is a private encounter. And then my, uh, my father died in, I think, in 1969. Uh, and uh, he had never attended one of my classes. So uh, I... I 
relented. And in the early 70s, I taught in Chicago from 1968 to 1974. I relented and, and allowed my mother to come to my class. Uh, and uh, my mother was an extremely polite woman. Uh, and when she walked out of class, uh, she looked at me and she said, are you a teacher or an MC?" <laughs> <laughs> But that's exactly right. No, but that's exactly right. It's funny, but it's true that you have to be an MC. Yeah. Because you're not trying to tell people what you know. You're trying to host a conversation among people of fundamentally differing points of view. And that's what you did at Yale. That's what the University of Chicago embodied. That's what we're trying to do at the National Constitution Center for people across America. And one of the teachers who embodied that for you was Harry Calvin at the University of Chicago, this great First Amendment theorist. I took Owen's civil, civil procedure class and also his free speech class. And you had helped Harry Calvin's son edit this posthumously published, thank you so much, volume uh, called A Worthy Tradition. And in this, Harry Calvin sets out a vision of the First Amendment rooted in Louis Brandeis's notion that speech should only be banned if it's intended to and likely to cause imminent violence recognized in the Whitney case and then in Brandenburg. So tell, and we, I just have to share too, I, I was a very overconfident young law student and I remember challenging you then too and saying the purpose of free speech is not just to provoke public discussion, aesthetic views should be valued for their own sake and I cited Oscar Wilde's defense of lying and you were unpersuaded by that and said, no, the, <laughs> the, the, the purpose of free speech is to provoke robust public debate. So tell me about Calvin and Chicago and how that vision of the First Amendment influenced the view of teaching that you just described. Uh, well, I, uh, I graduated law school in 19, I went to Harvard Law School and I graduated in 1964. And uh, I uh, clerked for Thurgood Marshall uh, when he was a judge, as I explained before. And following that, I clerked for William Brennan for a year. And following that clerkship, I worked for two years in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice, primarily under the supervision and direction of John Doar. In 1968, uh, John decided to uh, step down as Assistant Attorney General and he became the head of the Bedford-Stuyvesant Redevelopment Corporation. And I had to figure out what to do with my life. I was his special assistant, and uh, I just didn't know. I think if John Dorr stayed on to the present moment, I would still probably be working for him. But since he stepped down, I had to decide what to do with my life. And uh, at that time, this is around February or March, before LBJ lost the New Hampshire primary to Robert Kennedy. Uh, I uh, had a knock on my door, and it was the dean of the University of Chicago Law School. And uh, one conversation led to an another. And I began teaching at the University of Chicago Law School in 1968, in the summer of 1968, just as the events outside of the Democratic National Convention were unfolding. <clears throat> and while there, uh, I developed this relationship with uh, Harry Calvin. Uh, and in the book, I describe it as an apprenticeship. Uh, and the apprenticeship uh, was mainly conversations with him. Indeed, my wife is sitting in the audience here, and she'll remember the fact that uh, uh, I would, well, he didn't drive, and I would drive him home from the office and, uh, and then sit in his car, maybe for an hour and a half, while the conversation continued as my wife waited me to, to, to be home probably two hours earlier. And uh, the relationship with him, which took place in many extraordinary places that I describe in the book in Chicago, was largely a conversation 
uh, about what free speech required, another ideal of our Constitution, freedom of speech. And we just talked about it, and we disagreed, and, uh, uh, and it wasn't just my nodding my head, uh, but it was almost being at the foot of a, uh, of a forgive me, of Socrates uh, asking, what, what is free speech? And uh, we tried to sort of work that out uh, uh, over the six year period. Uh, he, unfortunately, uh, in the summer, I think of 1972, uh, he had a stroke uh, and uh, he was vacationing on Martha's Vineyard at that time and he was insistent in believing that God was punishing him for living such a luxurious vacation. <laughs> uh, so he was then confined to a hospital in Chicago where we moved, we had the same conversations except he was lying in a bed uh, recovering from a stroke and we, he talked about the book he was working on, this worthy tradition and uh, I sort of was really very much an apprentice taking uh, lessons uh, uh, from him. And uh, I left Chicago to join the Yale faculty in the summer of 1974, and he died in October uh, 1974. And then I spent the next 15 years. When he died, he left a manuscript of 1,000 pages. And I spent the next 15 years of my life working with his son, who was not a lawyer, and was only like 22 or 23 years old, uh, editing this extraordinary manuscript. And it was finally published in, in 1988. Another great figure who you describe is Catherine McKinnon, who was one of your uh, students, and she had a different vision of the proper balance between equality and free speech that provoked vigorous debate, but you were proud of her and learned from her, and she expanded your notion of sex discrimination. Tell us about what she taught you. Well, just to give the audience, uh, this is described in the book in, in more detail, but uh, I was at the Harvard Law School from 1961 to 1964. Uh, the Harvard Law School has, in its first year class, some 500 students. Uh, I happened to notice uh, that there weren't many women. I would think at a class of 500, there was something like 12 or 14. And once we, a few of us had a conversation with the then dean of the law school and asked him, why was this so? How could this be? And he said, well, the only women that want to come to the Harvard Law School are looking for husbands, and they're not going to become lawyers in any event. <laughs> and this is the important point. And I sat there, and my friends sat there. We who were, as I say in the book, the children of Brown, and we did not say a word. We did not say a word. We just sat and listened. That was the 1961 to 1964. I am at the Yale Law School in the, from 1974 on, and in the mid-70s, uh, I happen to have a student who knocks on my door. Uh, I describe the circumstances of that conversation, and that student is Catherine McKinnon. Uh, Catherine McKinnon is, uh, even at that point in the early 70s, mid-70s, I'm sorry, in the mid-70s, is working on the concept of sexual harassment. She's in a course that I'm teaching, believe it or not, on injunctions, but she sort of uh, detects a kindred soul, and we begin a relationship in the, uh, uh, the mid-70s uh, and that continues for a very significant period of time until uh, her, uh, her fame is exclaimed by the whole world. So there's no need for me anymore. But I, um, and, and during that period, 
between the mid-70s uh, and the late 80s, uh, thanks to my conversation uh, with uh, Catherine McKinnon, uh, I become deeply interested in feminism. And indeed, uh, in the early 80s, <coughs> I started teaching classes uh, on feminist theory, and I started writing on feminist theory, uh, thanks to uh, Catherine uh, uh, McKinnon. Uh, and I, I, I think when I spoke earlier about inviting students into the conversation, uh, I find one of the great pleasures uh, of being a, a teacher at Yale or at Chicago earlier is from the capacity to learn from my students. Ignore Jeff's comment about my dismissing his comment about uh, you Oscar did, you, Wilde. Did, you didn't dismiss it. You never dismissed any comment. I think you disagreed with it, but oh, you made okay. it feel, you made me feel valued. No, yeah. it was, you never dismissed anyone's. But I, I, it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous uh, pleasure to, to be able to be in a position to learn from my students, and I learned an extraordinary amount from Catherine McKinnon, and I try to sort of develop my own. Uh, theories and in independence uh, from her uh, as this uh, course unfolded. And as Jeff alluded, I have, a, I have a sort of different conception of the impact of, uh, of laws like pornography than she does, although I hear her sort of uh, argument uh, in favor of it. But that was an important point. But just to, to continue this one moment more, Jeff, if I may. Uh, in 1984, uh, I was teaching first year procedure. I don't, were you not, you were not yet a student Not quite yet. that, no, I was much, much younger than that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> 88, I started. Uh, and in 1984, uh, Yale University had a tremendous strike. Uh, uh, and the strike was by the newly unionized technical workers, which included the secretaries, if I could use that obsolete term. Uh, and issues of gender and sexual equality were very much on everyone's mind in the fall of 1984. The strike lasted for 10, 10 weeks. Um, after one of those classes, uh, a student, or a group of students, actually four students who I name in the book, uh, asked to have lunch with me. Uh, and I was really quite touched that they wanted to have lunch with me, so sure, let's have lunch. Uh, and I asked them, well, what's on your mind? And they said, you. <laughs> and what they wanted to talk about was the dynamics in my class, whatever Jess might say about him that they felt was having an impact on silencing women students. And uh, I listened to them. It wasn't an entirely pleasant lunch, but I listened to them. Uh, and uh, I realized that the, what, the, what sort of a, a sensitivity to equality, sexual equality, would entail in the dynamics of, of a class. And uh, I learned from them not just about what sexual equality means, but I learned from them how I could conduct a class which gave everyone an opportunity to participate, and no one was intimidated because they happened to be a woman, or happened to be a black, or happened to be of any uh, other uh, group that would felt uh, intimidated or, or unwelcome. And uh, I, 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 I think that still continues. I think her, Catherine McKinnon's major contribution from the 70s on has been to insist upon a re-examination of ordinary, everyday practices that might become oppressive to women or some other group. That is what the feminist agenda is, and it was a a consciousness and awareness uh, that she instilled in me.
We have a lot of questions that I want to ask, but there are many more of 13 figures in this book, and remarkably, three of them were my teachers in a single class. There was a class called The Limits of Law, and Aaron Barak, Joseph Goldstein, and Burke Marshall, all of whom own uh, portrays in this book, taught this remarkable seminar. Ladies and gentlemen, I just am so grateful to these teachers for this extraordinary opportunity to learn with these giants, and it's so exciting to read about them in Owen's book. Can you just pick one of the three and tell the audience about it? And you know, there's a lot to say about each of them, but we, we have limited time, so Barack, <laughs> Joe Goldstein, or, or Burke Marshall, who do, you, who do you want to talk about, and why did you choose them? Um, well, I, I, I think I'm going to choose Burke Marshall. And I'm going to choose it because of a conversation I had with my daughter yesterday. Uh, Burke Marshall, uh, uh, John F. Kennedy was elected president in 1960 uh, and had resolved after the appointment of his brother as attorney general that he was going to chart a new course for civil rights, uh, breaking from the tradition that Dwight Eisenhower had uh, uh, maintained. And uh, in, in uh, January of 1961, after the inaugural, um, Robert Kennedy came to the decision of who to appoint as Assistant Attorney General. And he appointed, uh, I described the interview and the dynamic, he appointed Burke Marshall. Burke Marshall, at that time, was a lawyer in a firm in Washington, a very distinguished uh, private firm called Covington and Burling. He had no connection whatsoever with civil rights. He was not active in the civil rights movement. He was not a practitioner in the way that Thurgood Marshall was. He was just a very, very good antitrust lawyer. Uh, and Robert Kennedy saw something in him, which I try to describe in the book, uh, that, um, that contained the uh, promise that he ultimately revealed, was that he, although he was a private lawyer, engaged with antitrust, he had a very principled understanding of what law was and a very principled understanding of what the Department of Justice and the federal government could do to implement Brown and hold uh, the promise of racial equality. And uh, Burke Marshall decided to keep John Doerr. John Doerr was a Republican, remember, appointed by uh, in the uh, Eisenhower administration, and the two of them worked together from the period of 1961 to the end of 1964. John F. Kennedy was assassinated, you'll remember, in November 22, 1963. Uh, Burke Marshall uh, was an antitrust lawyer. Indeed, when he was interviewed, he thought he was being interviewed to become Assistant Attorney General of the Antitrust Division. He had no idea that he was being interviewed to become the head of the Civil Rights Division. And after stepping down from the Department of Justice uh, in end of 1964, the beginning of 1965, he went to work for uh, uh, IBM, in Amunk as the Vice President and General Counsel of IBM, and stayed there until 1970, uh, and then became uh, uh, a professor at the Yale Law School in 1970. I joined there in 1974. All during this period that I was work, working, I mean, Burke Marshall, for those who are old enough, was a legendary figure in civil rights. Extraordinary figure for those with good memories is almost as significant as Thurgood Marshall. Um, and it had a tremendous impact for me when I was a student. And uh, I described that in the book, but I had never met the man. 
When John Doar became the Assistant Attorney General from 1965-68, and I worked for John for some of that period, I had never met Burke Marshall. Burke Marshall was in the office all the time, spiritually. He was in Amunk, uh, New York, but was the advisor to John Doar during this period. I never met the man. During the impeachment inquiry, whether there were grounds to impeach President Nixon, Burke Marshall was there too, but only spiritually. He was the one that was John would talk to and advise us what, what was to happen. He was this sort of figure in the background. And it was not until 1974 when I interviewed for a job uh, that I met Burke Marshall. When I interviewed for a job at Yale, I asked the dean of the Yale Law School, well, I want to sit in on a class. Uh, what class should I sit in? He said, well, maybe this one that Joseph Goldstein and Burke Marshall, uh, Barack, I mean, uh, um, Aron Barak had not yet joined that group, but it was Joe Goldstein and Burke Marshall. And the, the course was called The Limits of Law. That's the one that you took. I mean, courses at Yale go on for decades. <laughs> and uh, I said, OK, great. What is it about? He said, oh, it's about, I don't know. It's, I think it's about regulation of science. That's uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> so I walked into the room. And uh, of course, uh, it was a trap. Uh, I would, they expected me to conduct a class on the impeachment inquiry. <laughs> but that was the first time uh, that I met Burke Marshall was in, I mean, after hearing about him, being in his spiritual presence for uh, almost a decade, uh, I finally met the man and had the benefit of, uh, of uh, knowing him and deepening my admiration for him on a one-to-one -one basis uh, for the next 30 years until he died. Uh, I mentioned him among the three, uh, and it had to do with a conversation I had with my daughter yesterday. Believe it or not, my daughter read the book. So, uh, and, the con and the conversation was that was so interesting to her uh, and what was interesting to her is an important message to convey to this generation of lawyers, many of whom hopefully are sitting in the audience, is how people could perform ordinary work, ordinary lawyers' work, uh, and at some historic moment uh, be called upon to do something special that will draw on the inner character and inner spirituality uh, of the person. That don't think in order to do good in this world, you have to be a professional do-gooder. You can live the most prosaic life and at some point step forward and live to the ultimate possibilities that you present. You used the word spiritual twice in talking about Bert Marshall. Do you think there is something spiritual about living a life of justice in the law? Completely. Completely. That's what law is about. That's what's, the, and that's not as what's portrayed on law and order. It's not the common understanding or the jokes that all people often tell uh, about law, but I think that's what law is. It's, it's, it's such a special institution. It's so important uh, for our life. And that's what worries me a little bit about the, pre the present moment. I need to ask some of the great questions from the audience, and I'm eager to because they're so good. Thank you for listening so closely. Um, let, me, let me just my classes a couple are, together. My classes are known for never finishing on time. <laughs> <laughs> you know, here I'm a little tougher, actually. Generally, I, we do stop on time. And I'm going to give us, unfortunately, I think we only have time for 
I'm going to read, read three questions, and you can answer them, because we, we need to end pretty soon. Um, uh, what do you see today as the biggest unfulfilled promise of the Constitution? What is your opinion of Antonin Scalia, and was he rom a romantic of a different kind? And how have your studies of philosophy influenced your idealistic view of the law? Three great questions. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let me begin with the most difficult one, but let me be honest with you. Uh, I, I don't possess uh, any great admiration uh, for the judicial career of uh, Antonin Scalia. I mean, it is true that he had a kind of idealism. You know, he had very clear ideas different than equality, uh, certain ideas about liberty. Uh, some of them, for example, which had to play a role in the criminal law, seemed to make a lot of sense to me. But what I felt about his judicial career, and this is my own very personal reaction, um, I, I was constantly turned off by his lack of respect for his colleagues. I mean, there was hardly any time when he didn't dissent, when he was disrespectful of his colleagues and their capacity to come to terms uh, with the problem uh, before them. I mean, there was a smart alecness to him, a kind of uh, quickness to him that accounted for his fame. Uh, there was a kind of explicitness on his part that engendered followings of him. But I don't, I don't think disagreement uh, need take that form. I'm all for recognizing disagreement, but at the same time, uh, uh, at the same time, respecting your colleagues, not as a personal matter, but out of a recognition of how difficult it is to uh, reach the questions or the answers that they reached. And honestly, Jeff, I felt he was not respect, even, you know, even people who claim he was a personal friend. I mean, Ruth Ginsburg always says, oh, he's a wonderful person. He was a wonderful person, a friend. My God, I, I don't, I can think of decisions when he sort of ridiculed her and, and demeaned her and her position because uh, it was sort of cute and, uh, um, I mean, it was a very dramatic way of speaking, but I don't think it furthered the law. So I, I respect his commitments to the ideals, but the manner that he discharged his duties of office were not uh, the ones that I hold up to my ideal. Contrary to William Brennan, who was, uh, uh, had very strong views, but always, always respected those who disagreed. Someone like John Holland, who was one of the, not, he was not a member of the coalition, ruling coalition uh, of the Warren Court. He was on a, more the dissenting uh, voice. He, Brennan, respected that man, it's extraordinary. I mean, it's just extraordinary how carefully he listened to him, how gently he expressed his disagreement, how much he reached out to bring them within his understanding of it. That's a model of a justice, not, you know, not a flippant grandstander. Our country, this is going to the first question. Uh, you know, this is, reflects, um, reflects m my personal view again. You know, our country uh, has been, from its beginning, uh, cursed by how we handled race. This nation began 
with slavery, in fact, slave trade, uh, and was the great issue uh, at the moment, uh, one of the great issues uh, at the moment of the Constitution. Indeed, a mutual friend of ours, uh, Keela Moore, uh, has written extensively on how the Electoral College as an institution should be understood as a compromise for the slave states, which is a very interesting take on it. Uh, I believe that the Civil War was one of the most extraordinary moments of our constitutional history, not just because it produced the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment, but the notion of holding the nation together is just an extraordinary, extraordinary achievement and it was being divided uh, over the issue of slavery. Uh, and I think, this is my view again, that between 1954 and now, we have made great strides in confronting and dealing with our racial uh, issues. I still believe and anyone who reads about Ferguson, anyone who reads about the phenomena of mass incarceration, anyone who is concerned with new ID voter registration thing, knows that that work is undone. And I would say today, if you ask me what's the most urgent issue, it's the same issue that you saw at the beginning. The terms are different, the challenges are different, but it seems to me that we have an unfinished task before us. We're a different country. We now have a black middle class, extraordinarily symbolized by the events of November 2008 and the election of Barack Obama, but there are many black people suffering under the burden of our history still in the United States. And if you ask me what's the most urgent thing, it's the unfulfilled promise of racial equality. Philosophy, I'll leave that for another lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> Owen, um, at the end of the book, you say what you're proudest of and in your extraordinary career of, as a scholar in government, fighting for justice, what you said you were proudest of brought tears to my eyes, and that was your students. And on behalf of all of your students, I want to thank you for inspiring us and America about the idealistic possibilities of the law. Please join thank me in thanking Owen Fisk.